But uh, I, am, I am glad. And uh, Brother Mike Kelly, once again, uh, you know, when you made mention about the spiritual gifts and just not being preached enough, uh, I am so glad that we came to this because the Lord has opened my eyes to, uh, well, let's just put it this way. If I had it to do over again, if I could go back 30 plus years ago, I would have made much more of the gifts. And it hurts when you stop and consider that there are Christians that wind up letting these precious opportunities go to waste. Uh, you know, you talk about, boy, I, I don't know how the world does it without Christ. They, they macho it through, they think, but one day they're going to recognize just how much they did not have. Meanwhile, here we are as God's people, and there has been so much that has been purchased for us while there are people in the world and people in churches that are looking for ecstatic experiences, there's nothing that beats serving the Lord and doing that which you cannot do on your own. You just flat out cannot and watching other people do that very same thing. God has given us, well, you'll see, we've got much to go through. Uh, we have a lot in 1 Corinthians 12 and elsewhere. But uh, when, I got to, when I got to studying the counterfeits that Satan brings along, no wonder people get confused. No wonder there is not an understanding for the Christian, a solid understanding of that which has been bestowed. I'm, I'm going to get into this. We just got to do it. I could pontificate in generalities, but I don't want to do it. Let's just get to where... Uh, the Lord has his word. Second, 1 Corinthians chapter 12. Could we just read right for right now the first three verses of this chapter? Listen to Paul's detail. He says, now, concerning spiritual gifts, brethren, I would not have you ignorant. Now, the, the, there's, there's a reason why he is speaking this to the people at Corinth, as we'll see. He's chasing out, he, he's chasing down, he's, he's spelling out lessons for us all, detail. But here were people that were having a problem. And we will see, verse two, ye know that ye were Gentiles, carried away unto these dumb idols, even as ye were led. Wherefore, I give you to understand that no man speaketh, speaking by the Spirit of God, calleth Jesus accursed. That no man can say that Jesus is the Lord, but by the Holy Ghost. Heavenly Father, once again, I pray, open our eyes indeed that we may behold wondrous things. Pray in Christ's name, amen. First of all, I want to point out a challenge. When you stop and consider movements that we have had in the church, Satan has been subtle in weaving confusion uh, all through so many areas. And that's why I appreciated what we went to in the book of Joshua this morning that at every stage of our lives, we've got to be ready for the wicked one to come in and sow his seeds of confusion, sin, etc. When it comes to the spiritual gifts, he has done the same 
thing. He has done this because he, the devil, knows the importance of the spiritual gifts. Things that, uh, 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 an opportunity, a, uh, an exercise, uh, something that people can do for the Lord Jesus Christ to help spread the gospel where you have quiet people that all of a sudden have a boldness. You have shy people that are speaking to others about Christ. You have people that are nominal in their natural abilities, but next thing you know, they're running ministries. Different things like that. People counterfeit what is valuable. Satan does the same thing. If he can't get somebody to counterfeit, he'll get them to confuse the situation. If he can't confuse it, he'll corrupt it. One of the chief evidences of spiritual immaturity in this church in Corinth was the lack of discernment. And and I'll get to that in just a moment. If an occult practice, I'm reading about some what somebody else wrote about this, and I thought it was fascinating. If an occult practice seemed to have a supernatural effect, they assumed it was from God. So you wind up in a church situation where if somebody winds up experiencing something along the line of an ecstasy, uh, 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 you know, something where it's like, wow, what is going on? Well, it must be of God, not true. Like many Christians today, sadly, there are people that just get this general idea. If it works, it's got to be good. It's got to be good. But there were Christians in Corinth that had a question about this. And apparently, what took place, they contacted Paul and said, would you please clarify when it comes to the spiritual gifts? Because not all the leadership was on board doing what was biblical. I've told you this before. Uh, So if you'll bear with me, just in case there's somebody here that hasn't heard this. But I remember listening to a charismatic meeting where they were, it wasn't video, it was audio. But you had people doing some really strange things. And there were noises and ecstatic, you know, voices and such. And the man who was leading the meeting, the pastor, evangelist, whoever he was, I heard him say this, don't worry about what spirit it is. And I thought, my soul, you have just kicked the door open to the wicked one. I mean, don't worry, you know, aren't we to try the spirits? But that was not the attitude because the thing that was more important than the spirit that was doing the work was the experience. And again, had an attitude. If there's an experience, it's got to be good. There have been people that used to come to this church that are now in situations where they're looking to an experience. I remember talking to one specifically. I should have called him out on it. I didn't. I was listening, didn't want to get into it. And I think maybe I should have. But it's like, wait a minute. Book, chapter, and verse, please. While I show you a couple of things that ought to alarm you about that. So they asked Paul to tell them, look, 
How can we determine whether it's the Holy Spirit or another spirit? Like I said, 1 John 1, uh, 1 John 4, 1, Beloved, believe not every spirit, but try the spirits, whether they are of God. Why? This is important because many false prophets are gone out into the world. Because false prophets went out into the world, as we drive to church every time we pass a kingdom hall. Because the false prophets have gone out into the world today or yesterday while I was out, I wound up passing by two Mormon missionaries. They're out there. They're out there. They're preaching a false gospel. We need to recognize this. We need to be informed, not to an extreme. We don't, face, we don't put our main focus on the false prophets and the false doctrine. This is our main focus. But we need to be informed of counterfeits. If we're going to, if we're going to answer people when it comes to the gifts, this is what Paul meant when he came here, he says, you know something? I would not have you ignorant. Secondly, be desirous. We need to be desirous of exercising our gifts. And Mike, I think it goes back to that, that you know what? I, I, I fear, and I don't know how prevalent this is in so many churches, but I fear people that come into the body of Christ, do not recognize that they've been giving, given special gifts, and so they never exercise it. They never stop to consider that they can step out in faith and trust God with what it is that they have. So there was a desire, number one, there was a desire for clarity about the spiritual gifts, like Paul said in verse 1. Now concerning spiritual gifts, brethren, I would not have you ignorant. That comes from the same Greek word where we get our word agnostic. It means to know, to be ignorant of, or to not know something. It could be either to err or to sin. He didn't want them to be doubtful in this matter. Paul was, imp Paul was implying that look, when it comes to this area, we do need to be wise. Now, the word, the Greek word for gift, spiritual gifts, it literally means in the Greek, spirituals or spiritualities. He's referring to those things, again, that the Lord gives that we can exercise on. Spiritual gifts refer to special abilities that are from the Holy Spirit and are given to every single Christian. Hey, brother, can I meet with you right after the service tonight? Excellent. Thank you. No, you're not in trouble. I just need to get something from you. And it's not money. To be used to serve and meet needs of others. This is what somebody put there. That it's, it's amazing for the body of Christ to come together, it's not just a social event. This is why it's important for God's people to come together. You cannot replicate what the body of Christ is over a camera. You just can't do it. Now, for people that can't because of their, because of their inability, because of their age, or you know, physical things, we understand but when it comes to coming together, hey, listen, forsake not the assembling of yourselves together, period. That's, that's Bible. That's Bible. And there's a reason. And one of the reasons is we are called to exercise gifts of encouragement. There are gifts of mercy. We'll go on. You'll, you'll, you'll see those things. There's the call for these gifts is not self-edification. 
I, I'm not up here to make Ro Mike Rogers look good. First of all, that's an impossibility, especially coming up 70. <laughs> but this is just simply, here, you fade into the background. You know, I'm dead in Christ, but al I'm alive in Christ, but dead to self. This, this, is, this is for the Lord. Brad is back there as an usher for the Lord. Roger leads singing for the Lord on and on and on and on. We'll be mentioning some of these things. Ephesians 4, 8. Wherefore he saith, when he ascended up on high, Christ, he led captivity captive and gave gifts unto men. Later on in Ephesians 4. For the perfecting of the saints. This is why these gifts were given for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. Why? Verse, chapter, verse 13, till we all come in the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man, under the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. We come together, no matter how many, we come together to be honed so that we are a functioning unit. That local body of believers to do the work of the ministry. In two weeks, we'll have the Lord's table. Yes, we're going to have a picnic, but we're going to have the Lord's table and then we're going to have prayer again as we begin to warm up for that men's meeting. And I tell you what, Tim and Megan are excited. Every, you know, it's a lot of work, but every time it comes around. And we need to recognize that there are men, hundreds out there, that talk about this meeting and what God has done. Families do the same thing. Nothing like it. If you're wondering, now, now stop and consider. I know I, I'm looking at some aged saints, so you already know this. But if you're wondering if God has given you a spiritual gift, the answer is yes. And oh, by the way, one of the gifts is not critiquing the pastor. Right, Roger? <laughs> Everybody, including backslidden Christians, has a gift and they need to use it. They need to get right with God. We use the gift, and I'm getting into detail. There's a reason. We use the gift to serve others and to serve the Lord, not our Selves. Ephesians 4, 7. But unto every one of us is given grace according to the measure of the gift of Christ. 1 Corinthians 12, 7. But the manifestation of the Spirit is given to every man to profit with all. We'll see that in a while. Uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 7. But every man hath his proper gift, one after this manner, and another after that. The point is, we have it. 1 Peter 4.10, As every man hath received the gift, even so minister the same one to another as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. Peter is telling us we are stewards of something very precious. We are overlooking something that God has given, and it has come by his grace. It's been distributed to all by the Lord. That needs to be remembered. In doing this, in, in, in stopping and remembering, considering what we have in Christ, we need to stop, take a breath, and remember this, number one, look, we're not to use our abilities boastfully. We don't do it for pride's sake. Again, it's for Christ. 
we don't belittle ourselves in a false humility. I mean, hey, there's none of us have not anything to boast about. It's all been given by God. But we don't da- talk ourselves down so that we lower expectations from other people. No, listen, God is in control. We don't claim impressive gifts that we do not possess. I do not have the gift of good looks. I do not have the gift of brains like, I just ain't there. You know what I've got? I've got a great God. And you know, I want to be wise enough to use, to to be used, to surrender so that these gifts can be used by his spirit. All of us, all of us. We need to be thinking about that when we think about uh, retooling our outreach, about, you know, giving in missions, about giving period, about exercising our testimony in the community. We need to be thinking. We don't fail to use our gift out of jealousy. You know, I praise God for pastors that pastor bigger churches. If God has given them the ability, have at it. Absolutely have at it. By God's grace, I just want to do, I want to see Faith Baptist do what Faith Baptist can do. And that's it. If there are people getting saved elsewhere, praise God. If there are people that are pushing along with a dozen people on Sunday morning, praise God. Point is this, Christ is preached for God's glory. We need to recognize in the light of that, that not all of us are going to be a chandelier. I remember Dr. Bob Sr. saying, You know, people, so many Christians, Christian young men, they want to be like the chandelier. And again, you remember, this is from 100 years ago. He said, but you know what? He said, it's the back hall light that keeps you from breaking your neck when you get up in the middle of the night to go to the bathroom. Now, there's some deep theology there somewhere. But it's the truth. It's the truth. There are people that we will learn of in heaven that we never heard of, that it's stunning what they did for the Lord. In other words, don't blow it. Let's do what we can do with what God has given us. Look at verse two. Ye know, Paul speaking to the church at Corinth, ye know that ye were Gentiles carried away by these dumb idols. Dumb, they couldn't talk even as ye were led. Keeping the Corinthian Christians free from influence of past idolatry. This was Paul's desire. He let them know what you used to go after was nothing. They were dumb. They were ignorant. They they could not be. They, They couldn't be God. They were rocks. They were they, they were gold, silver, you know, they, they, were, they were wood. He said, you were Gentiles carried away. It's the same thing as a prisoner that's carried away to trial or to execution. But the, the, the question winds up coming this. How were these people led astray? Well, here's the thing. These exercises that these false religions had in the places of worship, in these temples and such, there were things from from immorality to ecstasies to, quite honestly, things that you wind up seeing in some charismatic meetings today. The tongues, the passing out, the, the, 
whatever. He said, this is what you wound up getting carried away with. They believed that this was supernatural. And because it was supernatural, it was automatically of God. Here were people that were acting like they were drunk. They were going into hypnotic chants. They were using drugs. They were using dances. They were burning incense. They had visions. And I have talked to people that in their so-called Christian worship, they're doing the very same thing, including unrestrained immorality, demonic possession was prevalent in Paul's day. Paul says, listen, there's supposed to be a huge difference. The man without Christ and a man that believes in Christ. He's saying this is not of Christ in these things that took place. The man that truly believes truly believes that Jesus is Lord, does so because of the work of the Holy Spirit, as Paul stated in verse 3. But the thing that you've got to see is their fruit. By their fruit ye shall know them. There was a man in the time of Trajan, man by the name of Pliny, governor of Bithynia, he demanded that Christians curse and denounce Christ. I went, when I was a youth pastor, I wrote a, a, a reader's theater play called of whom, the, of whom the World Was Not Worthy. And we had the testimony of, of martyrs and missionaries I'll never forget it. I loved writing it. It was, it was a joy, and the young people did a great job. We included this. A man by the name of Polycarp. He was the bishop of Smyrna. He was arrested, and the demand of the proconsul was, you say this, away with the atheists. Swear by the Godhead of Caesar and blaspheme Christ. This was Polycarp's, Polycarp's response. I loved it. Eighty and six years have I served Christ, and he has never done me wrong. How can I blaspheme my king who saved me? Anybody can get up. Anybody can get up and say, Jesus is Lord. That right there, that is Holy Spirit power. Remember what Christ said in Matthew 7. Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven. But he that doeth the will of my Father, which is in heaven. That's why we're told by the same writer, Paul, he says, hey, examine yourselves whether ye be in the faith. Prove your own selves. There's a world out there that's doing this. And there are people that are coming after it. And they're, you know, they're, <clears throat> it's, it, it, it's kind of sad. As things are changing in the world, as, as, you know, foundations are shaking, you know, on, on and on, and, and, and there are so much uncertainties that all of a sudden you just start seeing changes in people's lives. Next thing you know, you don't see them all that much anymore. You don't hear from them not that much. There are some people, praise God, they're faithful. We've got to get settled who we believe. We've got to get settled what we believe. Peter wrote this in 1 Peter 4, 
for the time past of our life may suffice us to have wrought the will of the Gentiles when we walked in lasciviousness, lust, excess of wine, revelings, banquetings, and abominable idolatries, wherein they think it strange that ye run not with them to the same excess of riot, speaking evil of you. Paul makes it plain, again, in 2 Corinthians. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. So, for the Christian, again, we have these gifts. There are differences of them. They are for the glory of God, not for man. Now let's go to a verse we didn't read. Let's go to verse 4. Again, 1 Corinthians 12, verse 4. Now there are diversities of gifts, but the same Spirit. We need the focus on the Holy Spirit. Spirit, I cannot emphasize that enough. And there are differences of administrations, but the same Lord. The Lord is in charge. And there are diversities of operations, but it is the same God which worketh all in all. Paul states there are diversities or different kinds of spiritual gifts, but they all come from the Holy Spirit. The focus, folks, is not primarily on the gift and which one I've got and what I can do with it to make me look good. It's not it. The focus is on the Holy Spirit. He is the source. One of the guys that I was reading, he said there's basically three types of gifts. Gifts of motivation, gifts of ministry, gifts of manifestation. Turn, if you would, please, to Romans chapter 12. Romans chapter 12, another passage that speaks of these things. Now, again, the... The focus is the Holy Spirit. We need to be looking at these things with a serious heart attitude. Lord, what have I done? What am I doing with this gift? I need, Lord, your guidance in this. Look at verse 6. Having then gifts according to the grace that is given to us, whether prophecy, let us prophesy according to the proportion of faith, or ministry, Let us wait on our ministering, or he that teacheth on teaching, or he that exhorteth on exhortation, he that giveth, let him do it with simplicity. He that ruleth with diligence, he that showeth mercy with cheerfulness. These are motivational gifts. These are things encouraging each other. Let's go through this quickly. First of all, prophecy. This this is the proclamation of the truths in the Word of God. We don't have, I don't care how many Bibles we have, we don't have enough of biblical truth out there today. We don't have enough in our churches. This involves exposing sin, exposing truth to God's God's people, to people in general, ministry or serving. This gift desires to free others from burdens and meeting the needs of other people. I can see this in our church. People, they have this, this desire. They have this gift of serving people. There's teaching. This gift makes the Word of God understandable. A pastor is actually a pastor teacher. We're going through this because God has called me to do this. This is not of me, it is of him. But 
teaching. It clarifies truth. It validates the, the information in the scripture. And what we do, like this morning, I mentioned this. Listen, we all have a decision to make. When it comes to discernment, where is the danger for how we think and who is in control of our thoughts and what we need to do? Therefore, make a choice. This afternoon, who was generally in charge of how we thought? You know, I remember, and, and this is serious, I remember having, it, it was almost like my default setting in my heart and mind was one of discouragement 20 plus years ago, 25 years ago. Man, that was hard. I needed help in coming out of that. Praise God, it was Jim Benny that helped me through that. We all have a default setting where we put ourselves in. Where are we allowing that to be? There's exhorting. Exhorting means to call near. This gift desires to stimulate and promote spiritual growth. You know, do not take it lightly that in the gathering together of God's people, no matter what size the crowd, the response can be an encouragement to others who are hearing the same truth. How many of you have ever had a situation where you're listening to a, to, you're listening to a message and it wasn't so much what the preacher said, but who said amen? It's the truth. I mean, there have been people that we... You know, Sharon, you remember uh, Mr. Packer. Remember him? I, 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 can, I, can, I can name off some people that you wouldn't know. But then there's people here that are in this church and we're in this church, and I praise God for their attitude. I praise God for their response to the Word of God. Then there's giving the person who makes wise choices and has the ability to give to God's work. There's ruling or, or organizing. I, I could name people right now that I believe they have that gift. One of them is sitting at a chair back there. When it comes to organizing, just getting people, okay, let, let's, you know, what, this is what we got to do, what we got to do. There's several of you in here that praise God, you've done that in different places. <laughs> Dan, how many times did you have, have you taken control of the parking here or directing people in the state capitol when we had all those people going in? You know, praise God, that's, again, this is gift. We've got some people here, they've got the gift of being a mechanic. There's a lot. And then there's mercy. People who can come. And, and Sharon, you did this in the prisons with your husband. You, you can lift a burden. When you went to see some of those men and you prayed with them, they're burdened about their families. They're burdened just about, you know, just living... You prayed. You loved those guys. That's the gift of mercy. They give comfort. Somebody with the gift of mercy, they, they give comfort in difficult times. Now, how many of you have ever met a Christian? They didn't have the gift of mercy. And, and sometimes they would try, but, you know, I mean... <laughs> You don't do it by walking up to somebody and, and, and with a smile on your face saying, suck it up. 
Now, now sometimes, you know, uh, guys know you need to be motivated. Hey, come on, just, you're, you're going to be okay. You're, you're going to be all right. But sometimes you've got to have somebody that they've got bigger ears than a mouth. You know, they can listen. They can shed a tear. They can pray. Your spiritual gifts, bottom line, your spiritual gifts makes you sensitive to certain needs that others may not perceive. I think it's fascinating when we wind up having more of a group and there are ladies that zero in on other ladies. Something's going on. Somebody needs to talk to somebody. I tease the ladies on Wednesday night. You know, they're all, y'all are over here. And, but you know, I guess ladies need that at times. And then the men need to remind them that they need to get to praying a little bit more. But I, I, I trust the ladies in this. I, I, I got to back up a little bit because A, my wife is sitting here and B, I'm starting to rile up Cheryl when it comes to this. So I, <laughs> once I'm on some thin ice, I really am. Each of us, in closing, each of us is commanded in Scripture to perform one way or another, actually, all of these motivational gifts. We can learn skills. We might have one down big time. But let us honestly do pray about, hey, doing what we can. We've got some other gifts we're going to be going to. But let's stop and think about this. We're all to proclaim the, the truth. In other words, be a prophet. 2 Timothy 4.2, preach the word. Be instant in season, out of season. We are all to serve others. For brethren, ye have not been called unto liberty. Only use not your liberty for an occasion to the flesh, but by love serve one another. We're all to instruct others. In other words, we can be a teacher. Colossians 3.16, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another. We're all to show mercy, true enough. Bear ye one another's burdens. So fulfill the law of Christ. But again, some people have a special gift for that, but we can all, to a degree, do it. We are to share with others. Be generous. Freely you have received, freely give. Romans 12, 13, distributing to the necessity of the saints. We are to be organized and plan ahead. Let all things be done decently and in order. And we all are to exhort others. Hebrews 10, 25, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another. And so much the more as you see the day approaching. The gifts and calling of God are wonderful. I pray that we get a little more excited about what God has done in our lives and what he has given us and how we can glorify our Lord and Savior in using them. We will continue there in 1 Corinthians 12 next Sunday night. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, some here might believe that there's not a lot they can do. Lord, if they're breathing, they can do. I pray that you would help us not to be reticent with our gifts, to renew our giving of ourselves to you, trusting you to use us as you see fit. Lord, I pray that people would be lifted up. Pray that people would be encouraged because people here surrendered anew to exercising Holy Spirit gifts that were given in their lives. I pray in Christ's name, amen.